Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Francophile Reader. So today, we will be talking about Chapter 3 of Communal Luxury by Kristen Ross. If you missed my discussion of the introduction in Chapters 1 and 2, I will link the video down below. Uh, in addition, I just want to reiterate that I would really appreciate if comments engaged with the content of the book in some way. Um, having personal opinions is perfectly fine, just try to ground it in something in the text so that the discussion can be about the book that we're reading for the read-along. So chapter three really talks about the intellectual influences on the architects of the Paris Commune, particularly the influence of science and what the author calls Darwinism, as well as utopian political models coming from Scandinavia. These are the two major topics in chapter three. So I want to talk first about the scientism, what that is, what is this Darwinianism that is being mentioned, and then talk about William Morris and his fascination with Icelandic politics. So anyway, let's begin with the uh, Darwinism. So what I think is really interesting is the scientific underpinning of the Paris Commune. So Kropotkin, who was a Russian geographer, he was of course familiar with the theory of evolution by natural selection. However, he disagreed with the Malthusian model that certain of Darwin's friends really defended. Um, so T.H. Huxley, very famously, who was, who was Darwin's friend um, and a huge promoter of Darwin's works, uh, really accepted this model that really centered competition. So the Malthusian model looks at human populations, or really any animal populations, in terms of competition, um, amount of resources available, and tries to predict what the maximum capacity of a population might be. Now, of course, competition is at the heart of Darwin's theory of natural selection. It is what leads to the selection of certain traits in populations. It's about being organisms surviving and having traits that are genetic so that they can be passed on to their offspring and that their offspring having those traits survive and have their own offspring at a higher rate than those who do not, right? That is at the heart of um, this scientific theory. Kropotkin and many other Russian Marxists did not accept this conflict-centered approach to understanding natural selection. They thought that there was also this other strain that was less emphasized, which focused more on cooperation and collaboration, that populations that were centered on cooperation and collaboration were ones that were healthier than those that weren't. Um, and that's how Kropotkin thought about it. At one point, Kristen Ross mentions Stephen Jay Gould, who was not totally on board with Kropotkin's modification to Darwin's theory and thought that this was an application that also wasn't scientific because, of course, Darwin is talking about organisms in a population. He's talking about biology. He's not talking about society. He's not talking about social relations. And this is how Russian Marxists like Kropotkin were applying Darwin's ideas. And perhaps capitalists were doing the same. I mean, there's a reason why we have the term social Darwinism to talk about all of the uh, unpleasant ways that Darwin's theory has been applied historically to social communities to support racism, eugenics, etc. So these false sciences. And I wonder though how Kropotkin's translation of or sort of engagement with biological science isn't itself a form of social Darwinism. Because, you know, he accepts parts of, of, of Darwin's theory, um, others he, he offers some alternative readings. Um, but even even so, he's translating something that is in the biological sciences to social communities and trying to imagine what the ideal social community might be. That, at least as someone who has a scientific background, seems like quite a leap. Uh, and Kristen Ross doesn't really interrogate that very much. I mean, she sort of takes it for granted that 
this is an appropriate way of applying biological theories. I would have liked a little bit more of a look at how Darwin has influenced different social communities, not only on the right, right, so thinking about fascism and um, you know, Nazism and, and, and the, these kind of racial theories, but also on the left. Um, I was just really surprised by Kropotkin's reading of science. It, it really felt a little bit unscientific to me. So this Marxist modification of Darwin's theory also informed the way that the communaire responded to peasants and the crisis of, you know, peasant communities. So whereas the Versailles, who are the conservatives here, um, places division between the city and the country, the communaire really wanted to challenge that division by saying, no, the peasants and the laborers in the city are both under the same st structures. They're, they're both victims of this capitalist bourgeois structure and they wanted to promote collaboration between the two. They also wanted to promote um, peasant collectivization, um, very much like peasant collectivization in, in Russia. I mean, that is at least what came to mind. As you may know, it was quite a failure in Russia. Something like 10 million peasants died, um, largely as a result of the famines that came from this failed collectivization experiment. Um, now, the, the Paris Commune was only, I think, 72 days, right? So we don't know what the result of this would have been. But the collectivization experiment hasn't always had the most positive effect on peasant populations. And yeah, I, I would have liked a little bit more about that. But yeah, one of the, the things that the Commune really wanted to do during the, the commune experiment, but then of course kind of developing it um, after the massacre, was this idea that the laborers and, and the peasants were really all in the same boat, in the same way that laborers and factories were being told that, you know, they should be able to own the products and to own the means of production, the peasants were now being told that they too should be able to own the means of production. One nation that is raised up as this model nation for the communaire is Iceland. Scandinavia today is still cited as this alternative to Western capitalism, that it's sort of the exception to Western capitalism. He really thinks about it also in kind of mythological terms, like Iceland represents this medieval world that he wanted to restore and then improve upon. Here's what Christian Ross has to say. Iceland was a kind of time capsule. The remnants of its then quite remote communitarian and democratic ways still traceable in the internal self-regulation and daily rhythms of its present-day social relations, in the cadence of its language and in the stockpile of its heroic ancient literature still, at that time, commonly read and recited. There is definitely this mythical reading of the past that informs William Morris's understanding and appreciation of Iceland in the 19th century, but in a way this mythical past can also be used to promote racist ideologies. Um, and it does seem in some ways to clash then with the communaire's vision of a society that is international, of communities that isn't tied to state. So once again, I get the sense of you know, certain aspects of the communaire's ideology being a bit similar to the ideology of those on the far right. Not by any means to suggest that William Morris is a racist, but that there does seem to be similar dynamics at play in the way that he engages with history and the way that fascists have engaged with history and have engaged with science. But I think what is really interesting is how William Morris and Kropotkin and Elisée Reclus, those, those three being the major, major architects of the Paris Commune, challenged this model of progress that is so at the heart of the modern world, that, that the world is always progressing toward, you know, in, in a positive direction. And they're arguing, no, like there are these elements in the past that are better and that we can turn to and of course build upon. We have to challenge this idea that history is moving forward, that we're improving as societies, as people. And so yeah, I th thought that this was a really interesting chapter for the most part. I didn't have as many things to say as I did in the introduction of the first two chapters, but I now have so many questions that I want to learn more about. Like, I want to learn more about this Darwinism that underpins 
the communard experiment. I want to understand how the communard understand history and, and this somewhat romantic view of medieval history. Also, what distinguishes people on the far right from the people from the far left when it comes to these topics. I think a chapter on Karl Marx himself and his engagement with the communal would have been really helpful. Marx is repeatedly mentioned in chapter three, but I think having a chapter on its own dedicated to Marx and you know the different strands of Marxism that influenced the communal would have been really helpful. Um, but yeah, so far I've been really enjoying it and um, I'm really interested in knowing what you all think about these kind of questions in chapter three. Do you feel I'm right in making these connections between these two extremes of, of the political spectrum? Or do you think that the communards are actually doing something very different with science, with history? I will be talking about chapter four next Friday. Thank you everybody for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.